And today we're going to have some fun. We're going to talk about the animals, right? We're going to talk about insects. And uh, I am an entomologist. Uh, I did all my work at the University of Nebraska, all my degrees there, uh, but also uh, focused on, on entomology, right? So, uh, and what a fantastic field to, to lead in. And it brought me to this uh, uh, profession within urban entomology. I started as a technician years ago, ran a route, had a uh, one man company for a while, then joined the other ones too, and became the technical directors and went forward. So it's been a fantastic career for me and my family. And it's all based on the animals. And we know there's a lot of benefits that insects provide to society, right? And to the ecosystems around the world. And you can see some of these Poll crop pollination is huge for us. We, one of the major challenges we have as, as a societies around the world is we have to feed people. We have to feed everybody and there's not enough land to do it, right? So we have to make sure we have the technology, but also have the animals, the insects helping us pollination and such too. And they ask, and, and insects will provide uh, direct uh, benefit with crops, so with different products like honey and silk. And biological control is a massive thing that many insects provide and other arthropods that helps key populations at proper levels within those ecosystems. And then think about all the decomposition that's happening out there, whether it's dead plants or dying animals or whatever it might be, those, those minerals and, and compositions have to be recycled back into the soil, back into the ecosystem that's available for regrowth. And that can, and insects have a major part of that. And of course, we also know there's threats involved, right? The most dangerous animal per se, if you would, is a mosquito species. We might think it's Vladimir Putin, but really it's the mosquitoes because of the amount of diseases that they can transmit around the world and have negative impacts on people, but also on different animals and such too. We also know that many insects impact our crop systems. And, you know, it's a major challenge to grow enough food to get it to the table so we can actually uh, support our populations around the world. So the less impact the insects have on our crops and our stored uh, foods, then we can help feed people. And that's great. Um, we also in urban pest management, right? I mean, we're involved with uh, protecting structures, whether it's termites, ants, carpenter bees, boars, whatever it might be, you know, we're protecting the real wealth and real assets of our customers. And that's great. And we have a lot of insects that, you know, just impact the quality of life of customers in a negative way. Now, many times it's in a positive way, but sometimes, you know, those biting flies or whatever can be a negative impact. And we can help with that as, as uh, pest management providers, right? So some of my topics today I'd like to cover, and, and we're going to go fairly quick. You're going to see a lot of beautiful pictures, I think, and I'm going to relate to some pretty neat aspects of biology. I'm going to talk about evolutionary successes, morphology, some of that internal structures, uh, classification, uh, how insects molt and how that relates back to taxonomy and some of these insect orders. And every now and then I'll sprinkle in, you know, a, a tool that we would use for controlling these populations and how it interacts with some of these uh, aspects of their biology. So let's jump in. So let's talk about evolutionary success of insects. And one of them is, is, is social nature, right? So we know that all the ant species are social species and, and they've been very successful because of those aspects. But one very important characteristic of insects and many arthropods, right, is that they, they have what's called an exoskeleton. You know, we as people, we have an endoskeleton, but insects have an exoskeleton. And it provides a, a covering over the body that gives them protection but it's lightweight and it's also got flexible membranes in between it so they can flex and do the movement they need to do. But it protects them from drying out. It protects them from pathogens coming in. It inhibits, you know, different things getting in that might harm them, including insecticides, right? But if you think about it out in the natural world, plants and animals and everything, there's an ongoing chemical warfare going on all the time. And, and this exoskeleton help protects the insects from those toxic substances coming in. And of course, these are animals, they're breathing, right? So they have to have gas exchange and it has to go through this exoskeleton. We'll talk about that. And very importantly, the exoskeleton is strong and it allows the attachment of muscles so you can use the torque with that attachment to have the movements that need to occur for life. So really a, a extremely important part of that evolution for insects. We also know that insects that are come in lots of shapes and lots of sizes, right? And we have some that are very, very tiny. I mean, you, you, need, a, you need a loop to, or magnifier to even see them. Then we have some that are almost a foot long, so, and everything in between. Now, you think about insects being fairly small, and, and what's that do for them? Well, it allows them to access lots of different habitats. They can hide from predators. 
Uh, they don't need as much food because they don't have as much body mass to support. And they can use you know, get into different types of habitats. And it could be, think about a, a forward fly being in a, in, a, in a little bit of a drain. Well, hey, you know, that's a pretty small little habitat. Um, also, many insects have different types of mobility. Now, many insects fly. Uh, and, you know, if you think about the mobility aspect, especially flight, I mean, you can get away from predation and that helps too. Or if you are a predator, you could use it to find your food, right? And search for your food. Um, it, it helps for dispersion. It, it allows for insects to find and utilize new habitats and then start new groups of individuals in that area. It helps them to find mates. And then, of course, flight, many insects migrate. Think of our monarchs and, and different uh, species that do uh, migration. Many insects like mole crickets and stuff do a lot of bur burrowing and that gets them into the proper habitat where they got the right amount of moisture and food and, and they're protected too. Uh, many insects can run or walk or jump, right? And that helps them to avoid predation, but also might help them uh, to, to catch prey, right? So it helps them with the success uh, of their biology. Now, not all insects, but many insects are what we call our strategists, right? And what that means is they can kick out a lot of young and they can do it very quickly, which means you can have multiple generations in a short period of time. Think about houseflies, right? They're going to kick out a lot of young and they can have a new generation every couple of weeks, right? So they're going to be kicking out really quick. So that allows for large populations to occur. And they can take over more habitats, right, as time goes on. But it also allows them to um, develop resistance to uh, something that's impacting their population, right? Because they can have a quicker genetic uh, uh, response to what's happening in the environment, right? So those short generations can, can allow for that to happen. Another really fascinating thing with some insects is that they have what's called parthenogenesis, right? Think about aphids here. And, and that what that means is for many generations, they do not need a male to interact with the female to provide the, uh, uh, for reproduction. Now, there will be some generations where a male is utilized, but it, many times, it's, it, it, for many, they're not, right? Well, that's a pretty big advantage to help increase that population very, very quickly. And on the other side of the coin, and I love this picture of this earwig, right? Earwigs, actually, they will care for their young. So they care for the eggs and take care of the eggs. And then when the, the uh, first instars come out, they will give parental care to those first instars. Now, what does that do? Well, it costs energy and resources for those adults to do that, but it increases the survivability of the young, which helps the species going forward, right? So you can see there's, there's uh, all extremes here uh, for success for these different species of animals. And we're going to talk about metamorphosis, right? I'm going to go into it in more detail, but metamorphosis, the changing from the egg to the immature stages and then to the final adult stage, it's, it's a huge adaptation that insects have, have adapt, or, you know, developed over evolutionary time to allow them to be successful and get into these different habitats. And there's different forms of metamorphosis or different types of molting. And we'll talk about that and how that, what that means for those types of insects. But it's a really, really critical advantage that they develop over evolutionary time. Now, if we put this picture up in a, in a second grade class or a first grade class, they're going to say, hey, yeah, this is an insect, right? And they're even going to say it's a grasshopper, right? So we, we all know that. But, but, you know, what are the, and I'll say, what are the four characteristics we would look at this picture that say, we know that's an insect? And many of you are saying it right now to each other, right? Number one, they have antennae, okay? So that, that's what's one clue. Number two, there are three body regions, head, thorax, and abdomen. And there are three pairs of legs, six legs total, but three pairs. And we already talked about it, but it has this exoskeleton, right? So we have these four characteristics in front of us with this, with an animal, then yeah, it, it classifies as uh, within the class insecta, right? It is an insect. So if you look at the head region, you know, we look at that antennae we talked about. In this case, with the grasshopper, we do have compound eyes. Um, some insects don't have compound eyes. Maybe they have what we call simple eyes or ocelli. And some have both, right? They can be used for uh, movement and polarization of light and, and, and orientation. And then, of course, the mouth parts. I'm going to go into more detail on mouth parts because there's lots of different types of mouth parts depending on the habitats they're in and their food sources. And there's the thorax with the thoracic region. And that's where we're going to have the three pairs of uh, legs, the jointed legs that are attached to it. And, and just to mention, you know, these are also called what we call arthropods. And arthropod means jointed leg, right? So uh, insects do have jointed legs. 
And uh, if there are wings, and not all insects have wings, and some have one functional pair, some have two functional pairs, they will be attached to the thoracic region. And then we have the, ab the abdomen, right, which includes uh, all the, the aspects and organs that are involved with breathing, excretion, reproduction, circulatory system, and we're going to talk about that in more detail. So let's go back to the exoskeleton a little bit because it's so key to their success, right? Number one, I love this picture. This is back from my classroom days as a student, right? But it gives you a depiction of what uh, an exoskeleton looks like on a cross section. And it's, it's composed of layers. You know, the outside, you have this waxy layer, then there's an outer cuticle, then an inner cuticle, then the epidermis cells at the bottom, which actually are used to help create the new exoskeletons when they shed the old one. And some of that old uh, inner cuticle can actually be recycled when they create their new uh, exoskeleton. But as you know, we see exoskeleton skins that are shed and they're left behind, right? So that's part of what we see and they have to be replaced. Now, the cuticle is composed of various proteins and a key building block protein is chitin. And many of us have heard that before because we use what we call chitin synthesis inhibitors for control. But chitin is that building block protein that's used to create this exoskeleton. And remember, these are very hard plates, but they're put together and connected together with flexible membranes, which gives them that flexibility to, to do movement and such. And I want you to think about this. This is really critical. Insects have a large surface area when you compare it to the volume that's encased. And that's really important because that's a major reason that waxy layer is in place on the outside because it helps keeps the water in so they don't desiccate. When you have a large surface area to, a small, to, uh, to its volume, then you can lose that water through evaporation very, very quickly. Also, it isn't just this cuticle and waxy layers, right? There are lots of different sensory hairs and chemoreceptors and glands and outputs and pores and spiracles and all kinds of things that penetrate through this exoskeleton, right? So there's a lot of complexity there to allow the insect to interact with this environment, find its prey, do its mating, all the things that it needs to do. So do we have products that we can use to target the exoskeleton? The answer is, is certainly we do. I mentioned chitin synthesis inhibitors. But also, and here's an example, Tridi, right? It has the pyrethrins, which is actually a nerve agent. We'll talk about that in more detail. But it also has silica aerogel or amorphous silica. And what happens is when we get the amorphous silica to, onto the exoskeleton of the, of the insect, the silica gel absorbs that wax. And when it pulls that wax away, it opens it up and allows what? Water to come out. So it leads to desiccation of that pest. That's why silica aerogel can be a very long lasting and very effective insecticide over time. Now, similar to that, and here's an example with alpine dust. Alpine dust has two active ingredients also, but the, the base is diatomaceous earth. And it doesn't absorb the wax, but it abrades it. And it kind of makes the same thing happen. It kind of busts it up and then the water can escape again and it can desiccate. It also has dinotefuran, which can also penetrate and get to the nervous system and cause an impact there. So that dual active ingredient. <clears throat> so let's take a look at the head in more detail, right? So we have the compound eye, we talked about the antenna before, I mentioned the mouth parts, but, that, you know, but the mouth parts have an upper lip, which we call uh, the labrum, we have a lower lip, we call the labium, and the whole thing composes the, the mandible area, right? Um, and then they could, you know, the palps that can be used for, you know, a little bit can help with mating, but also for positioning the food and that kind of thing. So a lot of complexity with the head, but, you know, the antenna is so critical for, for sensory. So that's a major sensory organ for them for sense in their environment. But since we're on the head, let's talk about that variability of mouth parts because you're gonna see this across the world of insects, right? We have a lot of insects that have chewing mouth parts, right? Like this praying mantis, termites munching down on the, on the wood of our customers, right? That we're, well, gonna be our customers, we're gonna take care of them, right? And that kind of thing. Roaches have chewing mouth parts, caterpillars certainly for the, the leaves they're munching on too. So, you know, very common types of mouth parts that we see uh, across the insect world. Here's a little video running with these termites, right? You can kind of see those mouth parts in the front of those workers. But we also have piercing sucking mouth parts and mosquitoes are a prime example of that. Aphids are a great example. You know, they stick those mouth parts into the, into the plant. It hits into the foam and it's got that turgor pressure and it starts pumping the fluids through them and they pull out the sugars and carbohydrates they need for, 
for food, and then the rest comes out the rear end and becomes black sooty mold later on, but honeydew to feed ants and other things in the meantime. Uh, moths and butterflies have a lot of variation between the species as to their siphoning mouthparts. And, and then the length and, the, and the, the way the siphoning mouthparts are set up are going to be sometimes very specific to certain flowers that have distances of corollas that are used to transgress to actually do the pollination. So they can get to the nectar and get to the pollen. So some of them are very specific. Some are general, more generalistic pollinators. Some are very specific for certain areas or certain plants, I should say. Um, flies, sponging mouth parts, many of them, house flies jump down and, you know, on your mashed potatoes, make a little goo and, and sponge it real quick and then pick it up and take it, right? So that, that's, that's a neat video to watch right before dinner. Um, then we have rasping mouth parts and some of these like thrips and, and mites. Now, mites are not insects, but they are forms of arthropods, right? Uh, but they have, a, a, many, many of these have rasping mouth parts. Think about a horse fly, you know, rasping, sucking type of mouth parts too can hurt quite, quite well. Uh, bees have a, a chewing mouth part, but it's been modified where it's chewing and lapping at the same time, right? So it really gives them a, a fantastic way for them to feed uh, as they're doing their pollination and such too. And then the antennae. The antennae on the head region can be extremely varied. And some of them are there uh, changed up for camouflage. Some of them are changed up because it allows them a better way to sense the environment, right? Now, we talked about the grasshoppers earlier. We call those thread-like antennae, which makes sense, right? Uh, termites, rove beetles, and, and we call these are what we call moniliform or bead-like antennae, right? And you can see how they're like a string of beads, okay? And rove beetles are like the picture on the right. Top right, you can see that too. Uh, lots of beautiful variation of antennae within the beetles, within the coleoptera. Uh, a lot of them are clubbed like we see here with the stag beetle. Um, and then we have uh, like these leaf beetles, we have what are called serrated, like a, like a, saw, a saw blade edge or toothed uh, antennae. And you can kind of see that what it looks like here. So that's a little bit of a club at the end of that too. And this moth, this cercopia moth, just a beautiful picture showing that the feathering of that antennae. And think about the surface area here and the interaction with, uh, you know, chemical signals and everything else going on around in the environment of that moth, right? So it can really hone in on finding that mate or whatever it might be by using that antennae. Uh, and this is a hoverfly. And I know that if you look at the picture on the up on the right hand side, that's a huge compound eye, at least huge for the size of this. Uh, hoverfly, right? But then look at the antenna in front of this. It's got a bulbous portion and then these two filamentous things coming off the front. And we call that aristate. That's an aristate antennae. And then, of course, ants and many wasps have what we call elbowed antennae, which is one way we can tell the difference between adult ants and termites. We're looking for that strong elbow antennae. We have one large segment and then a series of segments after the turn. And, and those are geniculate or elbowed antennae. Okay, let's move to the, th the thoracic region, right? And, and the thoracic region has three regions itself, subregions, right? It has the prothorax in the front, the mesothorax in the middle, and the metathorax in the back. Now, if we have a winged forms, like this grasshopper, and let's say there are two sets of wings, right? They will be attached to the mesothorax and the metathorax. You will never have wings attached to the prothorax. Okay, so that's one thing we can point out. And then each of these segments will each have one of those pairs of legs attached to it, right? So that's why we have the three different segments. So it's kind of nice to see the organization set up with these insects. Now, some insects don't have wings, right? We know that some are what we call secondarily wingless because they lost their wings over evolutionary time. And that will happen too. But the legs and the wings can be very diverse. And, and as, as we know, between the different species, and we can use that for identification. So let's talk about the legs in more detail, right? So many insects like ants have eggs that are designed for really efficient and really fast walking, right? Almost to running, right? But, uh, and then we have some like this praying mantis, they've been uh, adapted where, hey, they can grasp and they can hold and it really helps with predation as well as it helps with, uh, with mating also. Uh, and we know the jumping, you know, the grasshoppers, third set of legs, or the, the tibia, the femur, they've been enlarged to the point they can put a lot of torque into it, a lot of stored energy, which helps that with the jumping and getting, uh, escaping predation, but also it getting into new habitats and such too. And, you know, we have a number of insects that are associated with fresh water. 
uh, now one ecosystem they're not very good at is oceans and, and salt water, right? But they're really good at, at, at uh, we have a lot of species involved in freshwater. And you can see this picture of this diving beetle. If you look at the upper right, you can see how that's legs been enlarged to give it the surface area to, to push water, if you will, right? Give a, a swimming a action. And then this is a great picture of this mole cricket. You can see the enlarged femur and tibia here and, and, the, and the claws they can use to move soil as they excavate and dig and get into their habitats. Uh, you saw this on the very first slide, right? But these are, this is an urticating caterpillar and you can see all the, the structures there for camouflage and mimicry and also protection, but also it gives them a way to, to hold on to those stems that are feeding upon the leaves that they're, they're impacting. And cockroach is extremely good at running, right? And they have their, their legs set up for that so they can move quite quickly and tending the front. And even these Circe in the back, which are kind of like another set of antennae on the back that can, you know, uh, detect predators, air movement, whatever. That's why when we flush them out of a crack and crevice, one reason they come running out. Um, we also know the wings have a lot of variation. And of course, when you look at the butterflies and the moths, they have small scales on their wings and those scales separate uh, the, the light into the various uh, frequencies or wavelengths, if you will. So we get those beautiful colors, right? Some are more metallic, moths are drabber than maybe uh, butterflies in general, but still some beautiful, beautiful colors, but also very good at protection, mimicry, like big eyes that, that might look like a predator to, or that it would scare away something that might try to eat it, right? Um, Here's a box elder bug, but you can see what we, this is what we call a hemi-lytra wing, where the front is kind of leathery, but the back part, hemi's kind of half, right? Hemi is, is that's more membranous, and that's where that terminology comes from. Um, and now here's a picture of some flies, and, and we'll talk about flies in more detail, but they are 100% membranous wings, right? There's no leathery part to it. They're all membranous. Um, and then here's a beetle where the front pair of wings is this hard, hardened leathered elytra, and it protects the membranous wings that are the membranous back pair wing that's underneath the elytra. And then let's go to the abdomen, right? It's the largest segment, if you will, of the, of the insect. And it has a series of subsegments again, or largest body region, then it has these segments like six to 11 or so, depending on the species and the animals we're talking about. And within the abdomen, there's a lot of stuff going on, right? It, and it will house the genital appendages. Think about a, a female cricket. It's going to have that oviposure off the backside to lay the eggs in, in the soil profile. Uh, may have claspers that the males can use to hold females. Uh, and, and of course, there's going to be lots of non-genital things. Uh, aphids have cornicles on the back that they use to kick out alarm pheromones and different types of chemistries. We don't talk about the Circe of the cockroaches that helps protect them from predators coming from the backside. Uh, pro legs on larvae, that, that, that caterpillars that are holding on to stems or leaf edges and that allows them to feed and, and stay protected. And then within, you know, the insect, there's a lot of systems, right? There's a digestive system, a respiratory system, circulatory, nervous. And we'll go in a little bit more detail on this. And I think since I was a student, you know, you know and it was a long time ago, I was a student, right? But we're all students over time. But I was told, you know, when I, when I was going through uh, uh, my, my first entomology classes that insects really don't have an immune system. Well, we've learned over the last couple of decades that, yes, some have rudimentary and some actually more advanced immune systems. And we're seeing that uh, happen with, uh, it, it, we've learned much more about their life processes like that. Let's take a look at the digestive system, right? Um, and, 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 you know, think all animals eat and all animals have to convert that food to energy. So they have a mouth and they have a pharynx, but they also have a crop like many birds have a crop where they hold their food. And then that food then goes to the gastric psyche and it's processed to a point that it's com being converted by the mitochondria, if you will, from food into energy. <coughs> and that can be shared within the insect to feed those muscles and feed those different cells. And that'll happen through this midgut area. And then the waste is going to be picked up and then taken out through the rectum uh, through that process. So it's bringing the food in, converting it to energy, but then pulling the waste out and then getting that out. So there's a lot going on through that entire digestive system. Um, 
do we have target, uh, you know, control agents to target the digestive system? And, and the answer is certainly we do. We have a lot of baits that, you know, are going to be ingested. And then some of them actually target the digestive system like borates do. Now, some of these baits, you know, they actually target the nervous system. We'll talk about that. But borates, for example, they, they you know, the, the way they kind of work within the stomach lines, they bust up the stomach line to the point that it messes up so bad they can't really digest food and get the energy they need to properly, right? And they can digest, they can have borates enter inside either by grooming because a, a borate dust is on the outside of the cockroach and they groom themselves, or very commonly, we do it through a bait toxicant, right, where it gets ingested. Uh, another example here is here's Andro Pro, and this is a little different than the Andro at the big box stores, right? This is Andro Pro that's made for pest control professionals, and you can get this from our, your favorite distributor, right? But it's hydromethylon, and the, the fire ants will bring that in to the uh, internalize that, and then they'll have that active ingredient actually impact the mitochondria, and that the mitochondria in the cell is what converts food to energy, and it shuts that down. So if they can't convert food to energy, the cell dies and when the cell dies enough of that happens then the insect dies and that that's why you know andro pro they pick this up and within five to seven days later they're down because it's getting to that point they cannot convert the food to energy this has a really good label when you got pastures and you got rangeland and you got lots of places like that that there, there's opportunities for this product or this label so keep keep that one in mind if, if it helps you and you're in that part of the world with fire ants are, are an opportunity for you to provide service okay let's talk about a respiratory system right because you think about us as people right we have a respiratory system but we have an open lung that we breathe in air and then and grab the oxygen and kick out the co2 and then it, it enters through the blood system that gets pumped around well insects do this differently right? Instead of having an open lung, what they have is they have a whole series of tubes. And it starts with the largest trachea, and then it goes down to, to, to the smaller, uh, even tracheoles. And the openings that go to the trachea, we call spiracles. And you can see there's a set of spiracles on each of these segments. Remember, I talked about three segments of the, pro, of the thorax and a series of six to 11 on the abdomen. Well, look at all the various pairs of spiracles, right? And, and of course, the insects, you know, they don't know what they're doing, but they can time the closing and opening of these spiracles that's going to allow them to keep the water in, but also bring the oxygen in to feed the cells and kick out the CO2s because that's a waste, right? So really, really critical system, but it, but it gets down to the very small tracheoles that actually are going right to the muscle cells, right? You think about it, very, very fascinating how this has been set up. So can we target this system? Well, you bet we can. And I probably, probably the best example is a fumigant, right? If, if, if we get a fumigation to a, an insect population and maybe it's drywood termites, maybe it's bed bugs, when fumigation has been used for cockroach control, all kinds of different things, certainly protecting food supplies and everything else. Well, when they breathe in this fumigant, it gets into these trachea, tracheoles through the spiracles to the, the, to the muscles, and then it causes the expiration of the pest. Well, let's talk about the circulatory system, right? Because remember I mentioned that, uh, you know, people have a, an open lung. Well, in some ways, insects have an open blood cell, right? Because except for this, uh, the, 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 the aorta and the hearts, the rest of this the hemolymph, if you will, the, the insect blood kind of just sloshes around, but it does have pressure and it does give it flow. And you can see flow going into the legs and out of the legs and up the antenna and out of the antenna. And it's bringing food to all these cells and it's taking away the waste from the cells for excretion and getting rid of it. Now, there is not a single heart, but there's a series of what we call hearts or pulsatile organs that provide for this pressure to happen. And they're all connected through this single aorta, okay? But then it goes to this open body format that's just putting that, that hemolymph under pressure to move it throughout the inset. So kind of, you know, different backwards or 180 degrees different than what we do with mammals, right? It's a little bit different. So can we target within the circulatory system? And certainly we do, because the blood is going to actually take not just food and waste, but it's going to move around hormones like juvenile hormone that when an insect molt, 
depending on the titer of the juvenile hormone, the insect will molt to the proper stage. So the more juvenile hormone in the blood, then that's, that's going to be an immature, while if there's very little to no juvenile hormone, then that means it's time for the adult to form, right? So pumping that around. So what can we do? Well, we have what are called juvenile hormone analogs. And some of these are our IGRs like methoprene or a hydroprene, which we use with cockroach control, methoprene with mosquito control. And pyroproxamine is a very common IGR we use across many of our products in the industry. And when they get into the system and get pumped around, then when these insects molt, they molt improperly. And I love this picture on the right. This is from Kathy Heinsen. And Dr. Heinsen did a lot of work at Purdue early on where she looked at the impact of these juvenile hormones on these insects. And you may have seen this crinkled wing syndrome when you've used uh, you know, the GenCore products and that type of thing as part of your IGR approach. Because when they come out, they may not be dead, but their wings are all messed up and they're sterile, right? So then to create a next generations, it's not going to happen for at least those that got impacted by the juvenile hormone analog. So it's a really good tool to use as part of uh, your control of many of these populations. Think about those German cockroach cleanouts. This would be a tool you could put in as part of your uh, controlling with the, with the baits, with the, uh, the alpine or whatever it might be that you're doing. And then, of course, there's the nervous system. And we have a lot of tools that impact the nervous system. We'll talk about that. But you know, there is a brain within the insects, but it's not one single centralized brain like we have. There's a brain, but then there's like a whole series of ganglia, again, that are associated with these various segments, right? And, and kind of the, the entire thing kind of composes the brain, if you will, right? And then from the brain, we have the the inner, you know, the, the nerves that are innervating the rest of the muscles and then allowing for not just conscious actions to happen, but also subconscious or things to happen. So all, all the organs do what they're supposed to do. The pulsatile organs are pumping the blood, you know, all that's uh, from signals from these nerve, nerve agents, right? So all these different ganglia and then the brain itself. And, and I love this uh, picture. And, and if you want to take a snapshot of this, please do do a print screen or whatever. But I want you to notice to the bottom, I put the reference down. And this is from a really nice resource called Insecticide Basics for PMPs. And it's by uh, Dr. Dan Suter and Dr. Mike Scharf. And Dr. Dan's out of Georgia and Dr. Mike's out of, uh, out of Florida. Um, although I think you might be moving. I think I heard that. But anyway, this is free. It's a PDF. You can grab it on our website and you can download it. But it talks about these various tools. And the ones on the top here are ones that impact that nervous system, the pyrethroids and the pyrethrins, right? Uh, the neonicotinoids, you know, the alpines of the world, the premises, right? And then, of course, phenylpyrazoles, that's termidor. It's going to impact the nervous system, too. But down below that, we have quite a few that don't impact the nervous system. I've mentioned some of them, like the chitin synthesis inhibitors, those juvenile hormone analogs, the pyroles, that would be like chlorphenopyr, like phantom, right? And we talked about the fumigants too earlier. Um, and, and here's some of them we're talking about that do impact the nervous system. So the neonicotinoids like alpine impact the, the sheath of the, of the nerve system, the termidor, and I'll show you where it works within the synaptic cleft. Some of the older chemistries like the organophosphates, the carbamates, they also can impact the nervous system too. And we have a lot of pyrethroids in the industry and almost everybody on this call, if you're doing services, you're using a pyrethroid or maybe multiple pyrethroids and you'll recognize a lot of these active ingredients, right? Like permethrin and bifenthrin and alpha cypermethrin. These are very, very common. And all of these belong to a uh, the Iraq class of chemistry, you know, uh, group three, and they impact the, kind of the same areas. And where do they impact? They impact the sheath of the nerve, right? And so when we talk about rotating chemistries to not allow insecticide resistance to occur, we're asking that rotation happens not within the pyrethroids, but from a pyrethroid to a non-pyrethroid. And an example could be a neonicotinoid like alpine that's impacting this receptor in the synaptic cleft, or it could be maybe a termidor, which is impacting these phenylpyrazole receptors, which are different than the neonic receptors, right? And here's an OP or a carbamate that, that, that it's not impacting the receptors, impacting the transmitter itself that's going, going to hit these receptors. Uh, so you can see there's differences within the nervous system. So when we go from different 
classes of chemistry, different families of chemistry, like from pyrethroids to phenopyrazoles to neonicotinoids. That's a true rotation because the target sites are all different. So again, this is from that same book we talked about, that same PDF. What a great thing to have as a reference and hopefully you can get that. It, it, it's on the website there. So let's talk about reproduction, right? I mean, some insects, they put out tons and tons of eggs. I mean, look at this stat from driver ants. My gosh, one to four million eggs every 25 days. No wonder they you know, take over those habitats and they're massive, right? But then we have insects that just lay a couple eggs and take care of them and, and, and make sure they come to fruition, right? So they're not our strategies, they're gonna be what we call K, K strategies, right? And some eggs will overwinter, as uh, that's the stage overwinter. Some species of insects, they overwinter as adults or pupae or whatever it might be. And I already mentioned about parthenogenesis where you know don't always need a male involved with the reproduction. Very common with aphids and some other ones too. But then we also have uh, uh, some that give birth to live young. Think of a tsetse fly. We talked about the care that an earwig can give. And, and we call that viviparity. And that allows for a little bit of better survival, if you will, sometimes. We talked about the hormones, right? And, and I, I love that picture from Kathy again, showing that crinkled wings. But remember, there's also lots of pheromones that are actually being put out too. And, and, and depending on the type of pheromones, sometimes you're within the species, like it helps a, a male find a female. But sometimes it's a predator that's, that's detecting a, or putting out a pheromone to bring a prey to them and they can eat it, right? So they, they can use, uh, like I say, Mother Nature is not very nice out there at times. And sometimes they can use these chemistries to help them find their prey too. And then we have a lot of beautiful insects that the reason they look the way they do is because it helps them protect and stay alive so they can keep the reproduction going and keep their species successful. Love this picture of this Katie did, and you can see how it just, it looks like a leaf, right? It's protected. It's, it's a form of mimicry. And these cedar moths, this is just a fantastic picture. You can see how through evolutionary time, they've developed this pigmentation uh, through the scales, right? That looks like a cedar tree, but also look how they orient themselves on the, on the trunk of the tree so it works, right? It blends in tremendously, right? And this has been developed over evolutionary time. So different forms of, of mimicry to provide for protection in the way of camouflage. Uh, think of walking sticks, right? Um, if that stink bug on the upper right, I mean, it definitely looks like part of the plant. It's going to be very hard to pick that out. And also the stink bugs, many of them have, they're called stink bugs because so they can put out a, a defensive secretion that has a, a strong odor to it and a Predator didn't want to feed upon them, right? It tastes bad, smells bad, and all the stuff there. Um, this caterpillar here, number one, it doesn't look like a caterpillar. It looks like a, a plant aspect, right? So, therefore, that protects it. But also, these spines here kick out a defensive secretion, okay? So, uh, again, a lot of protection can happen not just by visual, but also through chemistry. Love this mimicry here. I mean, look at this measuring worm. I mean, it looks like part of the plant, right? Uh, it'd be very hard for a predator to pick that out as, as a food source. So let's talk about nomenclature, right? So every living thing in this world that we describe as scientists, right? We will give a name to it. And we use a process of uh, a taxonomy. And we have a kingdom, phylum, class, order, and all that kind of stuff too. So here's a granary beetle and you can see it's an animal, so it's animalia, it's an arthropod class insecta, it's a beetle, so it's a coleoptera. It's a very special type of beetle. It's actually a weevil within the family, the Curculionidae. And then it's got the genus and specific name would be like the name of that animal, right? Cetophilus granarius, right? And then the G should not be capitalized there. So that, that should be a lower G. Um, so, you know, king, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, okay? Hard to remember that. We had to memorize it for our testing and all that kind of stuff too. Here's some way, another way you can remember it. You know, King Philip came over for good spaghetti or kids playing catch on freeways get squashed, right? So there's different ways you can use a mnemonic to, to help remember this classification system. Okay, so I mentioned taxonomy because we're going to talk about the key orders. There's lots of orders, you know, there's 30 some orders out there, but, when there, but there's some that are very important for uh, what we deal with, but also just in society as a general. And they're kind of busted up by orders based on, you know, genetics and everything else too, and morphology, but also based upon the type of metamorphosis they do. 
And we know what metamorphosis is, right? But there's really kind of three major types. The first one is no metamorphosis. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. The second one is what we call incomplete metamorphosis. And basically that means they don't have a pupil stage. That's going to be the main thing. We'll talk about some other stuff. And then complete metamorphosis, which there is a pupil stage. And, and you can, we can you know, separate our orders based on that. So what about those that don't do, uh, um, they don't do uh, metamorphosis, right? A metabolis. So here's an example. If you like fireflies or springtails, you have an egg and then you have a hatch with what we call the nymphs. And then they, they do grow, but they don't necessarily metamorph, right? It, it, because they're growing in size, but really they're staying the same. Okay. And then you finally have that uh, adult stage that is reproductively viable. But even those can still kind of consider molting. Now, I will tell you that there are a number of scientists that do not consider these true insects because of these types of, of, of characteristics, right? So that's kind of an ongoing discussion that goes on in science. Okay. So springtails, fire rats, uh, silverfish, you know, some discussion about them. <clears throat> then we have those that we call incomplete metamorphosis and those that are complete. And another term you might have heard is for incomplete is gradual metamorphosis. And another word might be simple metamorphosis. And all those are kind of synonymous. Um, and then of course with uh, complete or you know, holometabolist is another term you may hear. So let's, let's focus on the hemimetabolist or the incomplete or the simple, the gradual, right? You start with an egg and then you have that first instar come out and then you have a series of nymphs. And depending on the species, you can have three, four, five, six, seven immature nymphal instars. And the instar is a term we use to talk about those individual life stages between the molds. And then you have that final adult, which is reproductively viable. So, you know, uh, examples would be aphids, cicadas, the true bugs. Wow, what's that mean, right? Well, these would be the hemipterans, orthopterans, the, the cockroaches, right? Uh, the termites, okay? They all kind of have this incomplete or simple or gradual metamorphosis. And the wings will develop throughout these instars and they get more developed with each molt till you finally have that final uh, complete adult with the, the wings are formed. So I mentioned true bugs, that's a very specific name for the hemiptera, uh, the cicadas, not, not that all the bugs are false, right? But it, it gives them a specificity, if you will. Uh, cicadas, leaf hoppers, plant hoppers, aphids, you know, good examples here. Um, so the true bugs that we, you know, give that special name, the hemiptera, hemiptera refers to this half wing that's leather and then this back wing, which is membranous, right? And you can see how this one doesn't cover it all the way. So that's where the hemi comes from, okay? It's kind of that leathery basal portion and the membranous uh, hind wing you can see sticking out. Uh, normally we have long antennae. We have lots of different species out there, 50 to 8,000 species. So a very successful order, if you will. Uh, lots of examples, stink bugs, squash bugs, libus bugs. And of course, our, our good friend, the bed bug, right? Now they've been secondarily wingless over time, evolutionary time, uh, but you know they don't have the wings like the, the water strider or the assassin bug do. Uh, cicada killers, or excuse me, cicadas. I, I actually had a cicada killer out front today that it was kind of messing with that, but uh, that's a wasp, right? But cicadas, leaf hoppers, plant hoppers, and, and, and the term we use here is homoptera, and, and H O M O refers to throughout. And you can see this wing is membranous throughout, right? So that's where this term comes from. And terra always means wing, P T E R A. So uniform membranous wings, thin, short antennae. Many of you are seeing the cicadas now, and you're finding their their exoskeletons on the molt on the outside, of, on the trees and that kind of thing too. Uh, we got the periodical cicadas. We had a really good hatch of mesquite cicadas this year. They've been very, very nice to listen to in the evenings. Uh, plant hoppers, uh, corn plant hoppers, leaf hoppers, different ones too. Um, aphids, uh, you know, that they're part of that too, that homoptera. They got those piercing, sucking mouth parts. And they're pretty important because, you know, they can transmit a lot of diseases to plants and be problematic. Now, also, they, like I talked about earlier, they can kick out the honeydew, and you can see this cornicles on the back end they use to kick out the, the uh, pheromones, right? But when they plug into a plant and start pumping that, that plant juices through it, you know, they can't use it all, so the, the, a lot of it comes out the rear end, and that's the honeydew that many of our ant species and stuff can feed upon. In fact, they'll protect or tend the aphids to make that happen. 
aphids, white flies, scale insects, uh, uh, other types of uh, uh, insects within this group that we've been talking about. Um, and then we have the orthoptera, right? So the grasshoppers, um, crickets and such, and, and ortho means straight. It's got that straight line across the top of the, of the nymphs and the adults, and then terra refers to wing. Lots of species, 20-some thousand or so. Uh, listen to these in the evenings, too. They do stridulation to call each other, rubbing the wings together with their legs and kind of species-specific on that. Cause a lot of damage to plants with the chewing mouth parts. Uh, crickets, locusts. I've had a lot of katydids this year in Central Texas, so I've been seeing quite a bit this year. Uh, mantids, another order. Uh, all pre you know, predators, right? So, uh, you know, a lot of species, but not tens of thousands, you know, 2,400 or more, or a little bit more. And they do form an otheca around their egg case, you know, an egg case around the eggs that helps protect the eggs to help with survivability. And then we have some different species out there that we deal with. And then, of course, we mentioned cockroaches, right? Lots of species of cockroach. Some of them are quite colorful and quite beautiful. Uh, and many of us have seen the Cuban cockroaches and some of the woods roaches that are very pretty. And now, of course, in the last 10 years or so, we've determined that termites are actually types of cockroaches. So now we got about 7,700 species of cockroaches out there, which include uh, the over 3,000 species of termites. And the <clears throat> termites have been kind of relegated to a suborder, if you will. Uh, and, and this may have even changed a little bit in the taxonomy, but just, you know, termites are cockroaches, right? That's kind of where we're at now. And I mentioned this earlier, but, you know, termites molt, and when they molt, they have to form that new exoskeleton, and they use chitin to do that, like all insects. But when we do our termite baiting systems, like the trelona and such, and they feed upon that chitin synthesis inhibitor, which in this case is novaluron and trelona or novofluoromoron and centricon, right? When they pick up that material and they molt, they're going to molt improperly, like that picture on the bottom. And then, of course, that can be fed upon by other termites, and they're going to molt improperly, and that leads to the collapse of the colony. So we're targeting the exoskeleton and chitin through this type of process. And here's a picture of the Trelona system, but just letting those termites feed upon it, letting them do their molt, that can lead to elimination of that population. So got a few minutes here to finish on these orders, right? Uh, but let's talk about some of the uh, uh, holometabolous or complete metamorphosis orders. And these are many times what we call the super orders because of the tremendous number of species and remember, uh, tremendous number of animals to associate with it. So you're gonna have an egg and then you have a closure from the egg and you're gonna have larval stages, not nymphal stages. And it'd be two, three, four, five, whatever it is depending on the species. And then each larval form kind of gets larger until you get to that pupil stage Right. And then within that pupil stage, which is usually it's pretty quiescent, not moving, but there's a lot going on inside that pupae. Then you'll have that final adult and you'll notice that the larvae look nothing like the adults. Right. The nymphs look like the adults who we talked about hemimetabolists, but not true here. And that's important, too, because the larvae are going to be in different food habitats than the adults will be in. Right. And in fact, many times the larvae will migrate to from a, a moisture gooey thing to an area where the pupae is so it's drier. And then the pupae will come out of the pupae later. And then you have the adult that goes to different areas. So, you know, totally different habitats, which helps the species because not relied upon one food source. <coughs> OK. First super order, diptera, the true flies. Okay, die means two, terra means winged. You can see the wings here. There's one pair of membranous wings. Immatures, we call them maggots. They got chewing mouth parts. Lots of species. My gosh, that's a huge number of species. We've only found about 125,000, but we estimate maybe a billion out there. That's just amazing to me, right? Uh, and many of these are medical pests. They can you know, transmit diseases. Now, why do they have one pair of functional wings? I'm going to start this video, and it is in slow motion, right? This is a surfeit fly, and I want you to look right below that wing. You'll see that dot going up and down. That is the end of a halter, and what a halter is, it's a gyroscope for this insect, and you can see it going up and down. It's in counterbalance to the flight of this surfeit fly with that wing. So it, it helps this fly, or flies in general, be extremely good flyers with only one pair of membranous wings because they're using this gyroscope technology to help them maneuver in three-dimensional space, 
right? So next time you kill a house fly and you got it there and you want to move that little membranous wing, you can dig in there and you will find that halter, right? So uh, what a neat adaptation that they, these that flies have to let them be very successful. And here's lots of examples of flies, right? Horse fly, blow fly, house fly, mosquito, screw or metrin, uh, to kids, right? Lots and lots of examples out there. Another super order, the beetles, coleoptera. Coleo is that sheath on the outside, and then that covers that membranous wing that's underneath, right? And a lot of variation in colors and, and structures here. Uh, very largest order of insects. Some of them are aquatic, uh, many feet underground, chewing mouth parts associated with them. Over 400,000 uh, species have been described. So it's more than we've described the flies, but we think there's a lot more flies out there, okay? And some of these can be quite damaging to crops, right? I think about some of our, you know, corn plants and stuff like that that get impacted by a lot of these beetles. Um, Mexican bean beetles, lady beetles, you know, very, very important out there for biological control. Bill bugs, fireflies, wireworms, long beetles, different ones out there. So another super order would be the Lepidoptera. Uh, lepido refers to scale, right? So that's the scales on the wings that allow for the refraction to the different wavelengths for the beautiful colors and the, the camouflage and the mimicry and then Tara's wing again. The immatures are called larvae or caterpillars, chewing mouth parts. Um, some of them have these pro legs like we can see here in this black sw swallowtail larvae here and then the monarch larvae down below. Uh, adults feed on nectar, very important for uh, pollination too which is critical and more than 180 species have been described in the moths and the butterflies. Moths are usually generally drab in color, but some are quite beautiful. They're usually most, mostly active in the evenings and many of them form this A shape that you'll see. Uh, and they have these feathered or filamentous antennae. Butterfly is usually much more colorful, active in the daytime, uh, kind of have the small knobs at the end of these antennae uh, and the wings are held straight up instead of that A form. Um, examples, and we deal with Indian meal moths, of course, in our pantries and, and food storage and stuff too, but southern armyworms can be very problematic in certain parts of the country at different, different times of the year. Corn earworms, very important. Uh, monarchs, of course, we're all very protective of that, and that, that's all good stuff. Then we have the, the hymenoptera. So these are the ants, the bees, and the wasps, another extremely successful order, so we call this another super order. More than 150 species described. Uh, we've, we've found over 20,000 ant species, and we think there's probably another 20,000 out there or more. We just haven't found. And they have these two membranous wings that are kind of hooked together. And, and the, the term hymen refers to this membranous wing, right? Not like a membrane. And chewing mouth parts, bees chewing lapping, right? Um, and, and a lot of these insects, not all, but many of these insects have very, uh, very uh, in, uh, complex forms of social behavior. Right, uh, saw flies, ants, bees, wasps, right, but all belong to, to this order. Okay, so kind of like we talked about earlier, uh, critically beneficial for our society and ecosystems around the world. Uh, we need insects and other arthropods to keep our populations going strong, right? So it's critical that, yeah, we don't need pests. We, do, we want to protect people, we want to protect crops, we want to protect plants and pets, but the same token, we need to keep our pollinators going. We need to keep our ecosystems going. And, and, and it's very critical that, that we understand that when we're protecting our, 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 our customer structures and food sources and stuff too. But we're also protecting away from public health pests, right? So we can do mosquito control. We can uh, protect our, our, our animals, such as dogs and cats and livestock and others from, from different types of public health pests that can impact them. That's critical too, as well as ourselves. And of course, you know, I'm not saying that ants belong on the windowsill and invite somebody's home, right? So that can certainly be taken care of as we impact or improve the quality of life of our customers through fantastic pest control. And, you know, we provide a lot of, of benefits, right? I mean, look at, uh, this, this is a, a slide from Dr. Phil Kaler, and, and thanks, Phil, for this. But look at a lot of the problems that pests can cause, right? Annoyance, stinging, allergic reactions, disease transmission, sometimes direct invasion of, of tissues have been impacted. And I've already talked about, you know, ruining food. I mean, and we need food to keep the world fed. That's critical. And then of course, they can destroy and damage structures. So we as pest professionals, I'm very proud of the fact that we take care of people and we take care of ecosystems. 
and we're taking care of society through a lot of the services that we do. So with that, um, I'll tell you what, Brad, I, I, I'm just going to go right to the end. And I'm going to go to the front and I'm going to put up my email again and I'll ask you if there's any, you know, any questions out there, any comments. Thanks, Bob. Uh, terrific presentation. Really interesting look at the inner workings of insects and how we can you know, take advantage of their biology and behavior for pest control. I uh, really enjoyed it. Um, we did receive some questions and we'll, we'll go through these during the next five minutes or so. Um, one question that came up was that with um, in insects without metamorphosis, how do you tell whether it is a, a reproductive slash adult or immature insect? That's actually a fantastic question because even the adults can still, you know, the, the word, I'll use the word molt, but grow, right? So uh, the, the difference is going to be reproduction, right? If, if they're reproducing, then we know they're at that adult stage. And I think that's probably the best way to look at it. Um, and you may not be able to know that until you actually, you know, uh, culture it, right? Um, but th that'd be my answer for that. That's a great question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Tim had asked a question about where to see that chart again, just to give folks a, a couple of folks that had questions about uh, getting a, record, a copy of the recording. And um, we actually we're, we'll record it and we'll provide everyone with a copy of the uh, uh, archive so they can go back and look at it again. We'll also provide a copy to BASF if uh, folks want to contact them as well. So, um, uh, Dr. Bob, a question was, is there a reason why some reference materials use the term simple or gradual in place of complete metamorphosis? Yeah, and I think that's kind of changed over time. If you look at the textbooks, you know, and, and you know, I was I started my graduate studies back in the 80s, right? So the textbooks I had back then are different editions or even whole different volumes than what they're using today. But when I was doing my studies, you know, we were using the word simple and gradual a lot. And, and one difference there was, and, and I don't see it as much anymore, but we used to use the word incomplete metamorphosis. And we were referencing uh, like dragonflies and damselflies, those that had a, a, a naiad stage that was in fresh water as an immature. And then the adult would be, you know, the flying dragonfly or, right, or, or damselfly, right? So I used to look at that as that was incomplete metamorphosis, but the gradual or simple was more like the terrestrial metamorphosis where you had the egg and then the nymphs and then the final adult. So it, 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 when I was a student, that was the major differentiation. Simple, gradual, it was terrestrial, but incomplete, referenced that uh, incomplete metamorphosis where the immature stage was associated with water, fresh water. Yeah, another great question. Uh, another question was, um, can you touch back on why termites are now considered cockroaches? Uh, very interesting was the comment. <laughs> yeah, and I think this is one of the things that we've really determined with the advent of using uh, uh, genetic analysis, DNA analysis, right? So, you know, historically, taxonomy was based upon morphology and uh, analysis of the, the animals, uh, not just morphology, but also can they interbreed, that kind of stuff, right? But now as we've gotten into uh, maternal lines and we built these, uh, uh, these databases where we can look at the genetic connections over evolutionary time, it was, very, it was quite apparent that the termites and the cockroaches were very closely related. Now, there are a couple of behaviors, if you will, I'll use that term, that kind of cross over. For instance, there is a, a Mastoturwes dariensis down in Australia as a termite that actually has a, a, an uthical egg case, right? So there are some crossover behaviors taxonomically too. But, but really, I think the, the science of genetics in the last 20 years has kind of led us to that. Uh, and then a related, oh, similar, similar type question. It was, you know, if termites are now a suborder of cockroaches, how do they relate to ants? Well, and, and they're insects, but that's about yeah. it, right? So they're they're really not related to ants. Ants belong to an entirely different order, like we talked about the Hymenoptera. Um, the, you know, the commonality would be they're both kind of social insects, which was, is very true. But really, they've developed that social nature separately over evolutionary time. Uh, a question was, uh, Dr. Bob, what are your feelings about DIY pest control, uh, specifically order by mail products that anyone can apply? Do you find them dangerous? <laughs> wow, man, that was a good one. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, what's my feelings, right? So uh, almost all, not all, but 
almost all the products that we're using in our services out there are what we call general use products, which means that when somebody owns it, they can sell it. Okay. Now there are exceptions and exceptions would be like restricted use products, which are like fumigants and stuff. You know, you can't do that, right? They're restricted use. So saying that there is a legal tenant that allows it to happen. Does that mean that people are familiar with them to the point they know how to use them properly, that, that should they be using them? And we all know examples where no, they shouldn't have been. Are there some people that use them correctly? Of course there are. Right. So I work with professionals. I'm a professional. I have a license. I would like to see most of these products be used uh, by professionals that are trained to, to get the results that we know that, that we want to have happen. So that's where I'd like it to be. But I also understand that legally, you know, it, it's, it's going to happen out there. So, uh, Dr. Bob, um, can you suggest a few books to gain more knowledge about insects? Oh, man, great question. Um, I, I did put up that PDF there that I think would be very enjoyable about the insecticides we talked about. Uh, I, you know, for a great textbook that's very thorough, uh, Board Along and Triple Horn is a really good one. Um, another thing you can do is go to the Entomological Society of America website, uh, click on the certification program, and there's a list of references they have that you can use for study guides, and, and some of those can also be utilized. And certainly, you know, there's some great stuff that PCT's got with, uh, you know, our, our late good friend Stoy Hedges books. I mean, uh, those would be fantastic for people to utilize. Uh, Malice is kind of our Bible, right, when it comes to urban pest management. So that's a great resource to have. And, and the last one I'll mention that's really critical. If you don't have it, you should get it. It is the Scientific Guide to uh, uh, Pest Control Operations out of Purdue. Uh, and, and get the latest edition. It's got the bed bugs on the count on, on the front uh, cover and all that too. And that's a great resource to have. Uh, Dr. Bob, uh, I never hear about IGRs being used on termites. If they are roaches, then why not? So um, great question. Okay. Uh, now those insect growth regulators that are chitin synthesis inhibitors are certainly within the termite baiting systems like Tolona and Centricon, those are IGRs that we're using. So what you I think what the question really is, is IGRs that are more hormonal in nature, like uh, the methoprene and that kind of stuff too. Um, I think they can have an impact on it. It's not that they don't, right? But it's going to be different. And the hard part about using with termites is um, the delivery system. You know, you have to be able to get it to them in a way that's going to last long enough to make it happen. And we can do that with the chitin synthesis inhibitors. It's really kind of hard with the hormonal-based uh, ones. Um, a question is, um, where is the lantern fly entered in the insect order? Ooh, man, let's see. Spotted lantern flies. I'm going to have to look that up. <laughs> <laughs> Good Great. question. Well, um, we are, uh, you know, I want to be respectful of everyone's time here. So we're going to uh, end with the questions there. We did get a few more that just trickled in, but um, Dr. Bob will follow up with those. Uh, and, and folks, if you didn't get a chance to ask your question in, you can see his email address is right there on the screen. Uh, and he'll be I'm sure happy to, to, to follow up with you. But um, with that, um, I want to uh, thank BASF and uh, for sponsoring this, uh, putting on this webinar. And uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Bob Davis for a terrific presentation. Now, Dr. Bob, you want to uh, give us any final words. I just thank everybody for the time today and it's hot out there. Be safe, drive safe and look forward to seeing everybody later. Take care. Great. And thank you to all of our, our listeners and our readers for, for joining us for today's webinar. Have a great day, everyone.